Coach, here we are again. I think this is the 11th year of Man Up, and we've done this several times, and I just always like hearing your heart. You know, why are you partnering with Urban Impact to do this conference every year called Man Up? You know, I think originally it was really simple for me. Um, I had a desire to be a more godly husband and father. Mm -hmm. Wanted to find community um, and support and encouragement, information. Uh, it was about to get better for me, and that's why um, we were really interested in the workshop format. We had breakouts and small groups and things of that nature where we could kind of meet the individual needs of, of dads. Um, and then I had supplementary wants and, and needs, if you will. I wanted to, to, to be a dad to those in my close proximity, whatever that meant, mm. um, friends of my kids, uh, people in my community and things of that nature. And so... Um, it's kind of grown from there, but initially it was just about finding community, um, brothers that, that we could sharpen our swords and, and get better together. Yeah. So I know every year you have a kind of a different message on your heart for, for dads. This year, what are you feeling? What's your message to dads out there? For me, I just, you know, I just want to honor, man, and, and, and shine a light on the stepdads. Mm. Um, you know, part of my desire to, to participate in this is because I'm a broken home kid. And, you know, I, when you're a broken home kid, sometimes you spend a lot of time wondering about um, things you don't have and making sure that you could be the best parent for your kids. And, you know, I was blessed enough to have a great stepfather and, um, and also thankful that time has taught me that because I had a great stepfather that I don't know that I missed anything. <laughs> wow. um, and it's been cool to come to that realization. And so, man, I'm here this year with a legitimate agenda, um, you know, shining the spotlight on the stepdads, man, and uplifting those guys and, and thanking them for, for the love and effort that they provide young people. Yeah, I think I heard you recently talk about just how you've had to, to grow as a leader. And, you know, you started off as a young coach and you were more of a peer or a brother. And then you said you kind of moved into a dad phase and maybe even moving into more of a sage phase now. How have you had to grow as a leader just being a, a stepdad, so to speak, or a father figure in, in players' lives? You know, to be honest with you, um, it, is, it has become easier. And, and because it's become easier, I've probably gotten better. Hmm. Um, the guys are now in the age group of my sons. Hmm. And, and so I recognize that. And so I, I'm probably more willing to push boundaries that I wasn't as comfortable pushing in the past. <laughs> um, when you're looking at a 22-year-old now through 51-year-old eyes, <laughs> you know where they are in life. You know the help that they need. And I'm probably a little bit more forceful in terms of um, getting in their space and, and being appropriately nosy mm. in an effort to, to, to help them in as many ways as I can. Looking back, do you feel like you could have done that as a young coach, or is that just something you had to grow through? Because I feel I, I feel that as a young leader. I, I think that mm -hmm. I think that hindsight is always twenty twenty. I think that it's something that you have to grow into and, and see. And I think at times, uh, time is the only uh, provider of that perspective. Yeah. And what are you learning of this season in your dad life? Your dad. I know your kids are getting older. When we first started this, they were still in school. And are you an empty nester yet? Getting close. I got okay. a 17 year old daughter. All right. Um, you know, I, I, I'm probably just the younger your kids are, um, the simpler parenting is because they're in your close proximity. Mm. Um, they have less decisions to make. You make decisions for them. Um, and I'm learning now um, that, you know, parenting is tougher. Um, <laughs> When, you know, I got one son in Boston, I got one in New York. Wow. Um, my wife and I, we're in prayer a lot, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and appropriately so. I just, I just think you don't, you think you have a, you have a vision of parenting getting easier. Yeah. Um, and on some levels it is, yeah, sure, don't stick your finger in that light socket <laughs> type things. But um, there's a lot of metaphors for that as you get older. Uh, it gets more complex, uh, while at the same time, I do think uh, it does get more rewarding as well, mm -hmm. just to kind of watch them 
uh, live out life and pursue their passions and, and, and be the type of people you hope and pray that they're capable of, of being. Yeah. Yeah. I got four under seven right now, man. And, uh, we're in it. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've yeah. been there. You've been there. Uh, a little bit about leadership. Um, I want to talk to you about one, just peak performers. So you've been in, you've been around athletics your entire life. You've seen players come and go. I'm just curious from your standpoint, have you found there's differentiators that separate great performers for people who come into the league and maybe fade away, uh, or even those who go on to become, you know, Hall of Famers? I do. Um, I think a lot of times we spend time and energy talking about talents, about blessings in that area, the things that God has given us. And, and really, I think when you get to this level, um, everyone's talented. Mm. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the work ethic related things. It's what you're willing to do as opposed to what you're capable of doing. Um, and, and I just think that's all around us uh, continually. I think that's one of the things that I really impress upon our young players. They're so excited about being shoulder to shoulder with guys that they've watched from a distance. They, they, they're excited about playing with TJ, about playing with Minka. Um, I always make a point to point out to those guys the things that those guys do um, that are not talent related. Mm. The habit things, the professionalism things, the commitment things, the work ethic things. Um, and that's as, as evident as their talent when you're around them day to day. Mm. But it's, it's still worth pointing out. Yeah. Um, because I want the young people to know um, the same could be true for them. Um, Everyone has sufficient enough talent. Uh, it's what you do with that talent, how you shape that talent, how you hone it, um, how you remain focused as, as you face the natural adversity that the game and life presents. Um, it's kind of where we spend our time in search of peak performance. Mm. Do you feel like drive is something that can be developed? I mean, are there people that get to the pros that maybe don't have that initially and they get it and vote it? Or do you feel like it's just you got it or you don't? I think it is a skill mm. um, in that I think certain people have a, a certain range of blessings in that area, um, but we can all get better. I equate it to hitting a golf ball. You know, some guys can pick up a golf club and be naturals, and, and, and that process is really fluid. Some people have to really work at it, but I think we all can get better at it. And I view a drive and work ethic and focus in a very similar way. Um, some people um, embrace it and, and what could be drudgery is not drudgery for them. Some people really have to work at it, but we all can, can, can get better. Yeah. I want to talk to you about adversity. Uh, I found this quote from you I just love. I love everything you say. Uh, if our team doesn't face enough adversity early on in the season, I create it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing builds a team like adversity. Uh, can you just talk about adversity? Man, because I think a lot of times as leaders, we face adversity and pain, and if we're not careful, that, that can cripple us. But you, th you see it as a good thing. Talk about that. I've just learned that it's always a growth opportunity. Mm. Um, I had a coach that used to say we win and we learn meaning that the, there is something to be gleaned um, when you're not successful. And if you commit it to what it is that you do, that you'll, that you'll, that you'll seek those things out. And so um, I think that's a mindset that I share. Um, I lear I've learned to embrace the misery associated with <laughs> failure um, and adversity. And I realize that there's always a silver lining within it and an opportunity to improve and get better. Um, as much as we hate it, growth can be uncomfortable. And I'm thankful that I've had enough growth in my life that I have learned to embrace um, the, dis the discomfort that comes with growth. And, and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon perspective, um, the more uncomfortable I am, um, the, the greater the growth opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, as you look back at your, your career then, is there, is there a season, not necessarily an NFL season, but maybe a season of your leadership uh, where you did face, where you're like, man, that adversity I faced that season or in that circumstance was excruciating, but it, it helped me grow immensely. Does anything stand out in your memory? I, I, I think, the, I think the, the 2019 season will always stand out for me, mm. um, professionally speaking. Um, 
Ben got hurt in the second game, and you know we got faced with a lot of challenges from a player availability standpoint. Um, and it took us a while to kind of gain our traction and find the new normal, yeah. if you will, and and find a way to 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 do our jobs. You know, I tell my guys all the time, football is our game. Our business is winning. <laughs> um, Let's go. Because sometimes when you're not handling business, you can you can hate the game of football, man. And mm. I never want our guys to hate the game of football. I got a love affair with football. It's always been great to me. Sometimes when I'm not winning enough, it's not as fun. Um, I think the I think the challenges that 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 we faced in '19, um, and that that specifically I faced in terms of shepherding or leading the group through the things that we faced. Um, was an awesome growth experience for me professionally. Yeah, that's incredible. And uh, you, you were talking about your affinity for football. I listened to your conversation with Ben, and uh, I didn't know. There, you, you were sharing there's a league out there on YouTube of players to play with no pads. Yes. That here you might buy a franchise. Oh, man, I love, the ace, <laughs> I love the A7s. Um, I'm just a football fan and uh, of, of all levels and types. Um, and when I watched – this league, when I watch these guys play, um, you see the love of the game displayed in the guys that play it. Um, and that's a cool thing. Um, it's fun. Um, those guys are having fun. Um, and I just appreciate it. Um, that's a component of my relationship with this game that I never want to move beyond uh, and graduate from. Mm. Um, I love it because it's fun. I love it because it's challenging. Um, and it's cool to see other people share that love. Yeah. Well, hey, with a few minutes we have left, I want to take you through the lightning round. We've never done that in our times together. So just a bunch of fun questions I ask yeah. in every interview. First is, what's the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Um, there's, a, there's an old coach that I work with, man, Rod Marinelli. Um, he was a defensive line coach in Tampa when I was a secondary coach. Um, he went on to be the head coach of the Lions. Uh, for a number of years and you know um, he always equated what we do to teaching mm. um, he was a he was an education uh, major in college and he talked about the the profession of coaching um, being a teaching one and 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 it's an art to it and that we prepare for each day the way that a teacher prepares meaning um, there's a lesson plan, hmm. um, and there's preparedness. And I just think that, I just think when I think about coaching, um, it's, it's oftentimes things that you do innately, the inter interactions with people, the caring about people, uh, the giving of your time and space and experience to others. But I also think there's a formality to it um, that shows respect for what's going on. Hmm from a preparedness standpoint. And I always thought that I had a heart for teaching and coaching. Um, he made me respect the profession, com the professional component of the vocation. Wow. The preparedness required to maximize the opportunity to capture the audience. Um, and it resonated with me because he took that analogy of teaching and a lesson plan and, and, and the things that teachers do wow. from a preparedness standpoint to maximize the time to capture the audience. And it, it, it took my appreciation for what we do to another level and it, and it allowed me to hone my skills in that area um, more intentionally. And really I kind of apply it to everything, to, to being a dad. Hmm. You know, um, just about every component of my life, I try to formalize it. Um, the things that I might do innately, I don't, I don't seek comfort in that. Um, I just, I, I try to prepare and I try to, I try to organize in an effort to maximize. Yeah. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Um, head down and working. <laughs> head down and working um it's just something that 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 resonates with me um 
my head's always down and I'm always working. Come on. Um, regardless of outcome of games and so forth or what have you, um, those things are irrelevant. It's about how you learn from your experiences and how you transition that learning into preparation for your next opportunity, whatever it may be. And I think if you're doing those things, I think you always got a mentality that's kind of displayed by head down and working. Come on. <laughs> Biggest le leadership pet peeve. Biggest leadership pet peeve is assuming. I think for me, um, mm. I just make a conscious effort not to assume anything, not to assume that, that my message is being received in the manner in which I anticipate, uh, not to assume um, that there's clarity in it, not to be soon, assume that even that the, that the audience wants to or is ready to receive the message. Wow. Um, I just have learned to work to keep assumptions to a minimum, uh, to respect the here and now and what's transpiring and my role in it. And um, I think it just helps me be, be at my best. Yeah. Open-ended last question. Anything else on your heart for leaders this year you want to end with? Don't be afraid to lead with your heart. Mm. You know, um, yeah. you know I, I know that leadership requires wisdom and, and, and intentional thought and, and, and those things. But I think, I think that we all respect it on that level. And we all um, naturally, I think, pause and, and understand the gravity of, of what it is we're blessed to do. Um, but we shouldn't let that slow down the heart component, um, the emotional component and, 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 and what that can bring. Um, and, and I think you have to be somewhat comfortable um, with your position and with what you're doing in an effort to, to, to be. We spend a lot of time trying to control the heart component of leadership. And I think the more experience you have, the more comfortable you are, at least for me, the less I try to control it and the more I, I let it lead me. Wow. So good. Coach, thanks yeah. for everything you do for Man Up. Thanks for everything you do for dads. Thanks for everything you do for our city. Appreciate the time today. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be with you.